Welcome to the Honors Marine Biology Marine Vertebrates Notes. Today we're actually going to cover a variety of organisms, starting with organisms that belong to Kingdom Animalia, more specifically Phylum Chordata, Subphylum Vertebrata, and then of course Class Chondrichthys. As already noted, we have covered class mammalia in the previous semester, including Cyrenians and Cetaceans. Class chondrichthys is made up of organisms such as the sharks, the skates, the rays, and the ratfish. These are then broken down into subclasses known as elasmobrachii and holocephaly. These organisms are made primarily up of cartilage, which means they're going to leave a very poor fossil record for us. The word conidros actually means cartilage, where ichthys references the term fish. So yes, these are fish. Other than whales, sharks are actually the largest living vertebrates on Earth. They have about 800 different species of cartilaginous fish, including all those listed above. The one that you see on the bottom right is known as a lemon shark. Sharks actually make up 350 different species of the 800 in total. Sharks have ventrally located jaws that contain five rows of teeth. These triangle-shaped teeth come in a knife or a saw shape. They also have teeth that have the potential of being flat, as noted here in A. B and C both have the knife shape. However, you can see the saw shape located on type C. In the picture that you're looking at now, there are some prehistoric shapes that are available for viewing in comparison to that to those that exist now. If you note over on the far right, you see a sand shark, a cow shark, versus that of a mako and a great white. You're viewing a cross-section of a shark's jaw. You can note the number of teeth that are present on the shark's mouth. One, two, three, four, and five. This last one is still developing along with the pocket forming here. Sharks continuously lose their teeth over their lifetime. Every time they feed, teeth are broken off and a new one is replaced. This tooth is about to be shed and this one will eventually replace it. During their entire lifetime, they can actually lose over 30,000 teeth. This slide is just to remind you of orientation. The upper portion of the shark is known as the dorsal region. The ventral region is the underside. The front region, where the snout is located, is the anterior region. And finally, the posterior region, located by the caudal tail. Sharks range from a variety of sizes. The smallest size of a shark ranges from 6 to 8 inches. Two sharks that are competing for the smallest shark are the dwarf lantern, and the spine pygmy. The largest shark on record is the whale shark, noted in the next slide. Sharks can live up to about 150 years, however the average range for most sharks in the wild is 20 to 30 years. Provided is a picture of a pale cat shark. Notice the eyes, how they reflect. Sharks have many means of protecting their body. The first mean of defense is going to be the type of scale, which is called a placoid scale. People often think of this as rough like a sandpaper feel. And the reason it has this rough feel is because of the spines that exist towards the back of the actual scale itself. So if you note here, you can see a picture of the scales. And when you're looking at the scales itself, this region down on the bottom actually is what catches your hand as you move from the posterior region of the shark to the anterior region of the shark feeling that sandpaper. The next portion is going to be, or the next picture is going to be of the scales again, however it makes it a little bit more clear. You can see the little line at the back of each one of these tiny placoid scales. Um, it also reduces friction for the shark as they're traveling through the water. Another important thing the shark uses to hide itself in the water column is the ability to countershade. And countershading is when the top side of the shark or organism is darker than the bottom side, which is lighter. This is so that when organisms sitting on the bottom of the ocean look up, it blends in with the light. And organisms at the top of the water looking down look dark. 
what I've provided you is a picture of a reef shark and you can see the different coloration that occurs where the dark side is on the top and the light side is located on the bottom. Buoyancy determines the position of the shark in the water column. For example, on the right hand side in the frilled shark you can see that it is neutrally buoyant. However, most sharks are considered negatively buoyant. As far as buoyancy goes, it is controlled by what's known as a large oily liver. The large oily liver is not only used to maintain buoyancy for the shark, but it is also used in holistic medicines. It is used to cure things like the flu, open wounds, and then cancer. Again, this is, has no scientific evidence to support it. They use their fins in order to stabilize themselves further in the water column. And when they're not in motion, they will sink to the bottom because of their negative buoyancy that they possess. There is a large myth about sharks that they must constantly swim, but the reality is, is that not all of them have to. Depending upon the type of species, sharks do not swim constantly. If they contain no spiracle, which is located posteriorly to the eye, they actually have to swim constantly because there's no other means for them to do respiration. An example of that would be the great white. If they contain a spiracle, they have the ability to sit still on the bottom of the ocean, and an example of that would be the bamboo shark. These organisms are listed in below. You can notice here on the great white shark, behind the eye, there is no spiracle, and over here on the bamboo shark, you can note that there is a spiracle located behind the eye. The spiracle allows for them to extract oxygen out of the water as the water is moving into the spiracle and over the gills. Great white sharks are organisms who lack a spiracle, open their mouth, and bring in water and force it over the gills in order to survive. The fins on a shark are used for stability. There are two dorsal fins on most sharks, however, some only have one. Those will vary in size. The one fin that allows for them to move and propel themselves in the water is going to be their caudal fin. As shown to the right, you can note the different shapes of the fins and you'll notice that the top fin is a lot larger than the bottom portion of the fin. In the case of sharks, it's considered heterocircle. In this picture, you can see the different shapes of the tail. In reference to that of a bony fish, you can actually see that they're the same shape, whereas in a cartilaginous fish, you'll notice that they are different shapes. Homo circle, homo meaning the same, and hetero circle, where hetero means different. Sharks use pits called ampullae of Lorenzini that are located on the snout, as indicated in the picture. These little dots pick up electrical currents in the water that are sent out by other organisms, sometimes in distress. The other thing noted on here is that Sharks have about five to seven gill slits. You can notice there's one, two, three, four, five on this particular shark. However, this one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's also some sharks out there that have six gill slits. On this slide, you can see the surface of the skin of a shark. On here, it has pores that enter into this particular area, and this canal is filled with gel. The gel-filled canal then ends at nerve fibers that send information to the brain of the shark to detect the areas around them. Sharks have a variety of organisms that they eat in their diet. All sharks are considered carnivorous. They are filter feeders if you're talking about the megamouth, the whale shark, or the basking shark. Some sharks, such as the great white, would possibly eat their own kind. In the case of a feeding frenzy, if a shark gets nicked by another shark, then they will turn on that shark and possibly eat it as well. In the case of these pictures here, you can note the diet. In this case, white sharks that feed off of South Africa tip will eat things like seals and sea lions. You can also notice that the end of the tuna fish here, or in the top photo indicated, there's a shark inside of a shark. And that does happen.
As far as swimming, sharks can't actually move backwards, and they also can't stop suddenly, and that's because of their pectoral fins being fixated in one location, and you can see that in here. They can't turn or rotate these. But the really cool things about sharks is that they have the ability to bend their body in half the same way that you can bend your ears in half, because your ears are made up of cartilage, just like a shark. The speed of a shark depends on the particular shark itself. Mako sharks, the short fin mako, is considered the fastest shark. It actually swims at a top speed of 40 miles per hour. However, it's been actually recorded at 46 miles per hour in short bursts, kind of like the cheetah. It can't run that long. It doesn't have enough energy. However, their cruising speed is more like a 1.5 miles per hour. They're really just moving along slowly in the water. In the picture indicated on the right hand side, you can see that the human's top speed is about five miles per hour. Depending upon the shark species though, 1.5 miles per hour might be slower than the average. Respiration of a shark occurs when water enters through the mouth and over the gills. As far as the term gill rakers, that's inappropriate. The term is actually filaments. Oxygen is then extracted out of the water and then exits over the gill slits. So in the case of how the water flows within the body, it's the opposite direction in which the blood flows. So if we have a profile of a shark here, and this is its mouth, and these are its gills that I'm drawing right here, happy little eye, water's going to flow through the mouth and over the gills. The heart, being located right here, is going to pump the blood forward in this direction meaning that it's making it opposite. Yes, it eventually turns around and goes this direction. However, the initial movement is posterior to anterior and the water is anterior to posterior. This picture is showing you how the water is flowing in over the mouth and out the gill slits and that the heart is pumping blood in the direction opposite to that. You can note some of the structures we've already learned about. We've got the ventral aorta, and we also have the afferent brachial arteries. In the case of reproduction for sharks, females are usually larger than males. The three different types of birthing method are ovoviviparous, oviparous, and viviparous. A reminder that ovo means egg and vi equals live. Gestation occurs anywhere from nine months to two years depending upon the species of shark. They can range from one to a hundred in each litter and there's no parental care after the birth has occurred and that's because sometimes the mother will eat the actual child or offspring, which isn't really good for the species. Last, they do sexual reproduction. In order to do sexual reproduction, sex meaning gametes, we're talking about the use of a uh, external genitalia called claspers in males that are inserted then into the cloaca of the female for internal reproduction. In this photo, you're looking at a kite fin shark embryo. If we're looking at the embryo, you can note a couple things. There's a dorsal fin here and a dorsal fin here. And the other thing that you can note on here is the presence of a yolk sac. And what that implies to us is that these organisms are actually going to be ovoviviparous. Remember, ovo equals egg. And so in the case of these organisms, they give live birth to um, their offspring. However, inside there's no nutrient exchange through the placenta because there's the yolk sac. Here we're looking at the anatomical structures of the shark. Uh, you've already taken a look at this. Uh, what I'd like for you to notice is the presence of the spiracle. Remember that organisms that contain a spiracle are able to sit on the ocean floor and bring in oxygen um, for respiration, whereas sharks that continuously swim will actually lack that altogether. Um, also a reminder that the tail is heterocircle. The upper lobe is a lot larger um, or uh, more prominent than the lower lobe. 
Oftentimes, students want to know the difference between a male and a female, which is clearly noted here. If we take a look at the anal fin, you can see that this is a female, and as far as the female goes, notice how uh, it's a nice, smooth, straight line um, that connects both of the anal fins. If we're looking at the male shark uh, up in the top picture, it has two extended portions to the anal fin, and these are known as the claspers. They are inserted into the female's cloaca for uh, internal reproduction, and that's it. There are many uses of sharks. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is going to be food. Uh, what many people don't know is that some restaurants, to save a buck or two, will actually use shark instead of scallops when actually serving some sort of scallop dish. And what they'll do is they'll take a round device and punch out circles from the muscles of the sharks and serve it to you. Uh, shark is um, very flaky and so has the ability to mimic scallops if need be. The next thing that they'll do is they'll make shark fin soup. And in some cases, it is a real sad story to hear that people will catch sharks, they will cut the fins off of the sharks, and then in turn, instead of using all the meat that they could uh, on the shark, they'll dump the shark back into the ocean. And of course, the shark can't swim without its fins, and it's going to bleed to death as well. So they've wasted the entire shark itself just for the fins to make this soup. That doesn't happen everywhere, but it does happen. Uh, the skin of sharks is actually used as shagreen to restore furniture. Uh, this is done in a bunch of different countries, but more specifically France. Uh, and you can see these are some pictures of what shagreen furniture would look like. Uh, shark's oil is also used. As you guys dissect the shark, you'll you notice, or you will notice, the different um, consistencies inside that it happens to be very oily, sometimes a little sticky. Now the sticky portion of it happens to be because of the preservative is mixing with the oil, but in the most part the oil itself is present throughout the entire shark, and that's due to the liver itself making it buoyant. Uh, it's thought to treat different ailments such as cuts um, or open source. And then the last one is cartilage, and cartilage is thought to cure cancer. And so in some cases, what they'll do is they'll take the shark cartilage, they'll grind it down to a pill, and then people who actually have cancer will utilize that in order to heal themselves. Remember, that is holistic medicine and not Western medicine. Uh, in this particular slide, we're looking at the goblin shark. I know you've already seen a goblin shark as I've shown you a picture of how it eats, um, but just for a little reminder, you have the goblin here. You have a full-size goblin here, and then, of course, an up-close and personal-sized goblin right here. Uh, in the top right-hand photo, what you can note are the dots, and you can see all the little red dots that are outlined here. Uh, those are actually going to be the locations you can find a goblin shark. That's its habitat itself. And just a reminder that this is the portion of the goblin shark that protrudes out when they go to feed. Also note the backward shape of the uh, teeth. Remember, that's how they kind of get their prey, and it stays in, so that way if it comes out, it scrapes itself. Sharks are attracted by quite a few things. Uh, first thing that they're attracted to, of course, is sea lions, and this depends on the specific shark itself, but um, white sharks are attracted to sea lions because um, that's their main food source. The next thing they're attracted to is garbage, so any sort of um, trashy waters you want to be careful about getting in. Um, if there's garbage floating around and the water tends to be really murky, um, it allows for them to kind of hide in that particular area, and this is uh, notable for all sized sharks. Uh, blood, of course, is an attractant for a shark, uh, and they have the ability to smell blood for um, over a mile away. Uh, and, of course, this is blood that you would bleed from your blood vessels, not menstruating blood. And I know that that tends to be um, a concern for some women, uh, but that is a myth that they're attracted to menstrual blood. Uh, the next one is urine, and so lots of urine in the water could attract a shark itself and feces falls into that same category. And the next one is rapid movement. And rapid movement could lead to this particular issue right here. And uh, what we're looking at is a shark bite on a surfboard. And what happens is when a uh, organism is moving rapidly in the water, your 
muscles are sending an electrical impulse through the water that the shark is picking up in its lateral line system in the ampullae of Lorenzini. And the way that their brains are actually wired is it's telling them that uh, there's an organism that is potentially in distress. And of course, um, that will provide them with an easier meal. Quickly noted here, these are the hammerheads, and a couple things just to point out on the hammerheads that they too have that ventrally located mouth on the bottom, and then they also have these eyes that are really set to the off side of their head or um, distally located off of their head. Um, on the next slide we're going to discuss the different shapes of heads. I know that this isn't super clear for you to see, I apologize for uh, the fact that it's fuzzy, but I want you to note the different shapes of hammerheads out there. Uh, in this case you can see how it's uh, rounded off in the end. This part is not as rounded as um, A. C actually becomes more straight and then D is almost a shovel like. So when we think of hammerheads oftentimes people think that there's only one shape but there are actually multiple shapes. The other thing that you can note here is that they all have the ventrally located mouth and the mouth is all similarly shaped for each one of these organisms. And then of course um, rounding up the next portion of this is that uh, they have the eyes that are located on the end of each one of their um, heads or on the edge of their heads in the most distal region. What you're looking at here is a cookie cutter shark and the cookie cutter shark is a pretty famous shark for the particular bite that it actually leaves um, behind. So if you notice here uh, the jaw shape itself, the teeth are extremely uh, sharp as well as uh, the jaw has the ability to crunch down pretty hard so uh, when the cookie cutter shark actually takes a bite out of something or another organism it leaves almost like this circular impression on the organism itself and so uh, they have the ability to determine if a cookie cutter shark has uh, chomped away at a particular fish or organism. Uh, you're looking at two different types of sharks here. In the top photo, you can see this shark up here is known as an angel shark. And then the bottom photo, photo this is known as a carpet shark. Uh, these two different sharks are almost like that connection um, between rays and skates to the um, chondrichthys, uh, elasmobrachii um, groupings on the taxonomic charts. You can note that the um, pectoral fins have elongated out here and you can also note that in the posterior region of the organism uh, it's become either a whip-like uh, look as opposed to a distinctive heterocircle tail. So these are the evolutionary connection between the skates and the rays to sharks themselves. All right, what we're looking at here is a nurse shark. Uh, you can see that the nurse shark has the spherical located uh, on the region posterior to the eye. And one of the things that notes this is simply the fact that it has the ability to sit on the bottom of the ocean floor. Nurse sharks happen to be one of the most numerous organisms to attack. Uh, and they're not necessarily aggressive and mean, uh, but they become numerous in numbers because more divers are encountering nurse sharks than any other sharks. And therefore, of course, if we have more human um, shark contact, we're going to increase that number of uh, attacks on those particular sharks. This is a bull shark. Uh, the bull sharks are a pretty cool shark. Uh, they have the ability to actually swim up rivers and uh, they have cool structures that allow for them to regulate the salt level um, so that as they're changing salinity uh, of water they don't actually take on too much water or release too much water um, being hypo or hypertonic. This is a picture of a saw shark. You're going to see another one in just a second. Um, this is just a very primitive extinct species. There are a few species left, however, uh, the numbers of these particular sharks is dwindling down quickly simply because the shape of their jaw or their extended snout. 
Here's that snout I was talking about. You can see the saw shape on the end. Um, of course, people love to have a trophy of this, and so um, many people will go out searching for it. Uh, however, it is endangered, so you have to be really careful um, when we're talking about these particular sharks because we do not want to lose them off of our planet as we thought at one point um, they were gone. This particular fish is a Port Jackson, uh, and a really big thing for you to notice here on the Port Jackson, and of course, is the tooth structure on this particular shark. Um, very, very different shaped tooth. You can see the flat, round look to the um, tooth itself as opposed to the triangle shape that we're used to. Notice the open mouth. These particular organisms are going to feed off of um, like crustaceans or stuff that are um, crawling around on the bottom of the ocean floor because they too have the ability to rest on the bottom of the ocean floor and they have a spherical located behind their eye as well. In this photo, you're looking at a basking shark. It's another filter feeder. Uh, what happens for the basking shark is that food and water will enter into this particular area. Uh, and then water will exit out over these structures, which are the external gill slits. Uh, oxygen will be absorbed through the filaments, and then any sort of food will stick to the rakers. And then what's really cool is that the food itself will then travel, so if this is the food coming in, it will travel down into the stomach and allow the organism to feed. Uh, and they'll eat anything that's actually in front of them. So smaller fish can actually get in there. Um, planktonic organisms, of course, are going to make it. Uh, there are only a few sharks that have the ability to do this filter feeding by opening their mouth. Basking is one of them. The mega mouth, as well as the whale shark, are just to name a couple to name. I inserted this photo just so you can see the sheer size of how wide the mouth actually opens up. Over here, here's a diver. The diver's probably about four feet in this particular direction, and not including the fins as well as the uh, shin bones there. So in relationship to size, you can see that this particular distance here can be about four feet in size and uh, that's quite large, so you definitely want to be careful if you're diving around these sharks as well as the whale sharks. Even though we consider them gentle giants, if you were to get hit uh, by the tail here or uh, run into the mouth of this guy, you're going to have some serious issues. This is one of my favorite sharks. This is the thresher shark. Uh, the heterocircle tail is extremely prominent in this particular shark. You can see the different sizes here. Um, the upper lobe being almost the length of the entire body of the thresher shark itself. And so if we were looking at this being four feet, this also could be four feet in length as well. It allows for them to propel themselves out of the water, which is what you have the opportunity to see in this upper photo uh, where they are breaching which is the term used to describe sharks that are jumping from the water. Uh, there's not enough time for me to go over each individual shark out there. Remember that there's 350 different species, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to look up a few on your own. So one of them I'd like for you to look up is the great white shark. Most of you are interested into this shark. Uh, remember, we do have them off of our coastline here. Uh, they travel along the Farallong Islands up north by San Francisco. They do migrate from there through Hawaii um, and back again. Uh, we have some migratory patterns that have been noted. Uh, lots of people are diving with great white sharks and there's a couple things that have been going on with animal rights activists is that they don't want divers to be diving with these sharks simply because um, some, of getting, some of them are getting injured by the cages that the humans are in to protect themselves. Uh, the next one is going to be the tiger shark. Uh, tiger shark is uh, one of the most dangerous sharks. Unlike the great white, it has a diet that consists of anything, whereas the great white prefers to eat things such as seals or sea lions. Uh, tiger sharks have been um, known to find some very interesting things inside of their stomachs. In some cases, we've actually had them find um, a license plate, a half of an alligator, they found a suit of armor, super crazy. Another one here is the mega mouth, uh, similar to that of the basking shark. I'd also like for you to look up the Greenland shark. Uh, the eye on the Greenland shark usually has parasitic worms that are associated with it, so our um, thought is that they have poor vision, but they have a super great sense of smell. 
the angular rough shark, and then of course the silly one, the cow shark uh, that has been mentioned here. One more thing I wanted to mention is that you should also look up the blue shark. And the blue shark is known as the wolves of the sea. And that's because the blue sharks will actually pack up. And when they pack up, they have been known to follow ships in the ocean. And this isn't because, you know, people are jumping overboard and they're consuming them, but they're dumping trash and they're dumping food. And yes, occasionally some items of um, liking will make it into the water and they will consume it. The other thing that happens that you have to be really careful about if you're a shark is that if you happen to be in a feeding frenzy and you get nicked by a shark, sharks will turn on you and then actually consume you as their meal. So uh, just a kind of side note out there.